This is our season finale. A second season looks virtually certain, but let's make sure. Special guest number one, Drake. He seems to be following someone in the mist. Special guest number two, we'll find out that's Nellie Bly, possibly America's most famous journalist at the time. She was making a trip around the world in 72 days, imitating Jules Verne's famous novel Around the World in 80 Days. Fun little side note, after England, she went to France where she met Jules Verne. go who the guy I fell on I have a question teacher if bog was holding Drake's cloak when he hit his omni shouldn't bog be going with him since when do we leave pieces of clothing behind the omni doesn't automatically change your clothes the time tunnel does that November 19th London 1889 I say hello there everything all right well I think the lady here fainted I I think she was attacked or something. Attacked? By whom? Well, I really didn't get a good look at him. Uh, we sort of dropped in and he just disappeared. He checks her over. She'll be all right, but I suggest we get her off the street. An American woman reporter has no business being in this neighborhood. They say, how do you know she's an American reporter? The cloth of her coat, naturally. American coarse wool. My lamp, please. She's obviously only a working woman. The clothing is businesslike and made for hard use. To be in this street at this time of night is not something a tourist would do. Rather, someone looking for a story. She carries a notepad and pencil, hence a reporter. Special guest number three. What, you don't know who that is? Why, I would think it's elementary. She's coming around. You're still a bit woozy, Miss Bly. Who are you? Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle. And I can help you if you'll let me. I think we all know what his address is. 221B Baker Street? This is great! This is just how I picture it whenever I read Sherlock Holmes' adventures. His adventure? Singular. I haven't been able to write for a year. He wrote Study in Scarlet and then nothing. He's completely blocked. He's ready to give up on Sherlock Holmes. Phineas? Bog? You must be joking. Well, why would I do that? Oh, come on. You know darn well that I'm trying to break Phileas Fogg's record of Around the World in 80 Days. It's being carried by all the papers. Phileas Fogg? That can't be a coincidence. Character in the book by Jules Verne. Jules Verne? He traveled around the world in 80 days. The French guy. Yeah, I met him once. Pulled him out of a brawl in Montmartre. I doubt that. He's over 60 years old. Hey, Bog. Do you think he named the guy after? I guess he had to. I get the feeling we've waited all season for that. We're pulling out all the stops on this one. That expression comes from a pipe organ, by the way. Most organs have several sets of pipes for making different sounds, and when you press a key, it lets air through the pipe, and that makes the note you hear. If you don't want air going through that set of pipes, you push a knob or something similar, and it closes off the air using a plug called a stop. When you pull out the stop, you get sound through those pipes. Pull out another stop, you get two sounds at once. Pull out all the stops, and you could blow the windows out. But it sounds spectacular, like what we're doing with this episode. Nellie says, I need to get back out there. I want Jack the Ripper to catch me. Her goal is to catch him and get his story. When Dr. Doyle heard that, he called the men in the white coats, and Nellie never finished her trip around the world. I'm going to catch him. How? Oh. By appealing to his pride, his conceit. As soon as I got here yesterday, I put an ad in the London Times, daring him to meet me tonight at the scene of his crimes. Bravo. You succeeded. Oh, wait a minute, Dr. Doyle. I think she's onto something. Her trick worked all right, but one tiny derringer isn't enough to catch someone like him. As she discovered, because when Drake Omnied out of there, he took her little pistol with him. Tell us all you remember. So you can steal my story? Uh, no, so we can help you. You may be able to lure him out of hiding, but you're not going to be able to catch him alone. Not to insult your journalistic eye, but do they look like reporters to you? 
She recounts the evening up to the point where she lost consciousness. Did you see the face of the man that attacked you? No. All I saw was his black cape and some kind of shiny what? Watch. Okay, Nellie, keep your reporter hat on and think. The one you saw was silver. Boggs is brass. Try to keep that in mind. Whatever she's thinking, she's not telling anyone, at least not Dr. Doyle. She excuses them all and says, I'd like to rest now. I'm sure that's what she'll be doing. The way I see it, we got two problems. Jack the Ripper was never caught. After a sixth victim was found, no one ever heard from him again, right? Right. Right. Wrong. There are only five victims that were more or less confirmed to be Jack's work, and they all happened in 1888, not 1889. So we gotta get Nella to forget this Ripper stuff and complete the rest of her trip like she's supposed to. And Doyle's gotta break his writer's block and get back to writing Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. Nella ought to be a snap. All we gotta do is keep her up here until her boat leaves and stick her on it. Doyle, now he's gonna be in trouble. Wrong, Bog. You mean wrong, Bog. Doyle's easy. He's in the apartment. Where do you think Nellie is? Looking for Jack the Ripper. Bog runs after her yelling, because that doesn't look suspicious in the night fog at all. She starts calling for a Bobby to help her and finally runs into a bar in the same area where she was attacked before. Nellie, didn't you hear me calling you? Why'd you duck out like that? I said I wanted to help you. Well, if you really want to help me, you can buy me a cider. Are you kidding? We're not staying here. Yes, I am. Hey. If the lady wants to stay, she can stay. And there's about eight other guys I counted who agree with him. Guess you'll buy her that cider. We see Drake cut and light another cigar, all very slowly and deliberately. It's very Twin Peaks, even though Twin Peaks hadn't happened yet. This time we get to see that it's Drake, as if we didn't already know, and watch him flash back to Boggs' trial and his downfall. Of course he blames Bog, even though it was Susan who found his secret diary and all the rest. And as I recall, I was the one who told them three times to take away his Omni and nobody listened. Right now, he appears to be watching Nellie and Bog from somewhere. When I said you could take a smoke break, that is not what I... Never mind. It's almost as if he demanded to be written. Demanded? During the process of creating him, the images came so hard and fast, it was all I could do to get them down on paper. Commercial typewriters were around by this time, and Mark Twain had submitted the first ever typewritten manuscript to a publisher in 1883. But most writers would write their manuscripts out longhand and then type them if they typed them at all. I didn't look around the room to see if Dr. Doyle has a typewriter, but even if he did, it wouldn't help him in that situation. Believe me, I know. I began to feel he was almost impatient with my slowness. Come on, he seemed to be saying. I've got things to do. There. Perhaps that's my problem. I'm talking about Holmes as if he were a living, breathing person. Dude, I mean, doctor, that's how the best writers do it. He terrifies me. He scares you? Intimidates is more the word. Jeffrey says, but he's part of you. He came out of your mind. Doyle says, yes, but when I'm writing, it's as if I can feel him trying to take over. Look, I saw you collecting clues tonight at the scene after Nellie was attacked. Wasn't that something that Sherlock would do? I suppose. We do both have a curious nature. You have a curious nature. You gave it to him. I try to believe that, but he just overwhelms me. When I wrote my novel, Josiah the Child King, I became King Josiah. I got interested when I wrote a scholarly article about him for one of the journals somewhere in the 90s. Short version, there are two different accounts of Josiah's reign in the Hebrew Bible, and I was digging into the ancient languages and customs and such to compare the two. I realized this was a fascinating character, so I novelized him. I got so into the character I sometimes had difficulty separating him from me. Thing is, as the doctor is about to find out, that's not a bad thing. Then let him. What? Let him overwhelm you. I mean, we've got a perfectly good case right here in front of us. We're worthy of him. Why don't we bring the Sherlock out in you? Why don't you become Sherlock Holmes and find Jack the Ripper? 
Neither Sherlock Holmes nor Dr. Doyle, nor anybody else for that matter, caught Jack the Ripper, but if it jump starts his writing, go for it. If you want to read a good summary of the lore around Jack the Ripper, as well as a fresh theory about who he was, check out Patricia Cornwell's book, Portrait of a Killer. It's fascinating. I say, Watson, this is interesting. Come, have a look. What do you see? Dirt. Dirt now. Previously mud. To be precise, clay-based mud of the type found on the threshold of the cock and crown where the pavement's been torn up. Was well, that where you got it? Well, why would I do that? Jeffrey's 12. How's he supposed to know what you do in your spare time? He says, I scraped it from the attacker's footprints at the scene. Here's what I want to know. How does he know what the mud in front of that pub looks like? At some point, he must have gone over there and scraped some up so he could analyze it. So one point for Jeffrey. That is why you would do that. But how can you be sure that the footprints were his? There were no prints other than the victim's, yours, and Mr. Box. The fact that the attacker's prints only lead to the crime, and Mr. Boggs only a lead away from it, I have not yet been able to deduce. Jeffrey could probably answer that, at least why Boggs' prints only lead away from the scene. And if he's thinking, he'll do a little extrapolating and figure out why the attacker's prints only lead to it. But he's not thinking right now because he's not Jeffrey anymore. Special guest number four, Dr. Watson. Also extraordinary were the samples found from both yours and Mr. Boggs' prints. Yeah, why? Sand. Sand totally alien to England, to this part of the globe. Yes, I'd place it somewhere in the northeastern segment of the Sahara. Again, when did he get a sample of North Saharan sand to compare it with? That was often my problem with Sherlock Holmes. How did he know all this random stuff? I'm afraid it's got me stumped. Well, he's No, 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 don't tell me. I'll get it eventually. I doubt it. So say we all. Let's look at that cigar. Doyle, I mean Holmes, says, a gentleman who carries a very sharp knife. See this indentation? Mm-hmm. It's from a holder, further augmented by the fact there are no teeth impressions. The affectation of a gentleman, perhaps a bit for fop. Fop? Flashy and pretentious? Drake? Really, sir? He says, that cut was made with a professional quality blade, probably a scalpel. Our gentleman took Miss Bly up on her challenge. Had a leisurely smoke at the Cock and Crown, and once she'd passed the pub, left in pursuit. A cold-blooded man, I'd say. Continued to smoke during the attempt on the young girl's life. Fantastic. Elementary, Watson. Nellie's been waiting for a Bobby who usually stops here about this time. But he's late, and the bartender says sometimes he doesn't stop. Bog wants to know who she's talking about. You're meeting somebody here? That's right, mate. She's meeting me. Ooh, watch it, Alf. He's a big one. For one. But not for all of us. <laughs> I have a feeling we shouldn't have stopped for a cider. Winner take all. Let's get it. Get it, boys. No! While Bog is trying to fight all those guys, Nellie has found her policeman. Hold it right there, gents. Hey, great timing, Nellie. All right, miss. Which one is he? There. That one. The one in the middle. That man is Jack the Ripper. Bog said, no, my name is Phineas. It's tattooed on the inside of my leg here in case I forget. For reasons I shall never fathom, they take him to Dr. Doyle's place instead of to Scotland Yard. Dr. Doyle, or Sherlock Holmes if you prefer the persona he's in right now, is puzzling over another mystery. The stuff he's finding on the bottoms of Jeffrey's shoes. Why, this is a piece of quartz, the variety of which I believe is found only in the most remote regions of the South American jungle. Ah. Huh. A sequoia pine needle. My boy, you do get around. How? He says, don't tell me, I'll figure it out. Thing is, if Jeffrey told him how he does it, Sherlock Holmes just might believe him. It was he who famously said, I'm going by memory, so don't chastise me if I botch it a little, if you eliminate all other possibilities, whatever remains, however unlikely, must be the truth. And he's right. This is how I know Jesus' resurrection was real. Other theories have been set forth over the centuries to try and explain why the writers and the apostles might have lied or been mistaken or it was a myth or this or that, and none of them hold up under scrutiny. 
The only theory that's left after we look at them all and evaluate them is the one that's least likely, but it's the only one left, so it must be the truth. It happened. The inspector and the others bring Bog inside. Nellie says, I caught Jack the Ripper. Nellie Bly is going to be an international sensation. Doyle says, you've done no such thing. This man is completely innocent. And might I ask your name, sir? Doyle. Dr. Arthur Conan Doyle. Doyle. He's a writer. He wrote uh, a study in... Study in Scarlet. Yes, I know that book. That made Scotland Yard look like a bunch of ninnies. Which is precisely the way they will look if you insist on convicting an innocent man. You're standing in his living room and you had to ask his name. Special guest number five, a ninny. Doyle walks them through the attack and especially how the cigar fit into it. He demonstrates that there's a fresh cigar burn on Nellie's sleeve, and he proves conclusively that Bog doesn't smoke. But Nellie is one of those not-so-rare people who can't stand the idea that she might be wrong. One cigar burn doesn't prove you're innocent. You could have dropped the gun anywhere. And what about the other evidence? What about that thing on your belt? This. She saw that on her attacker, Mr. Bog. Can I see it? Did she now? She's sure it was that device that she saw. The V. I saw a flash of silver in that V. And then I fainted. Think about what you just said, Nellie. Is that thing silver? The inspector didn't catch it, but honestly, I'm not expecting much out of him. And much to my surprise, Holmes didn't catch it. Or if he did, he's not saying anything. But I think Bog and Jeffrey are starting to put it together. Nellie points to the cape. Bog points to the broken clasp where he grabbed the attacker. I point to the fact that that cape with Bog's clothes is about as likely as a snake riding a bicycle. The inspector asks about the footprints. Even Sherlock Holmes can't answer that one. All right, well, what if I told you that device could make you appear and disappear? It sounds mad, but it would explain it. Unfortunately, the inspector's brain doesn't stretch that far, so he arrests Bog. Within seconds, it's all over town. They caught the Ripper. That's right. He's in there. I heard one of the Bobbies say, Ah, the gallows is too good for him. Well, I'd like to see him swing. Yeah, yeah, swing him off. Funny the different ways rumors get started. Nellie is riding high. This trip around the world, she said, was basically a publicity stunt because British papers refused to print her articles. But now they'll pay attention to her. You know, I remember reading about you, Nellie Bly about how you exposed the terrible treatment of the mentally ill and about how your stories end in the awful abuse of the kids working in the factory sweatshops. Wait a minute. The thing that impressed me most about you, the, the, thing, I, the thing I really, really respected was how you got to the bottom of your stories, how you, you dug your facts up, how you go to any length to expose the truth. Now that Nellie Bly was a good reporter. And you can see by her face that he's starting to hit a few nerves. He says, this Nellie Bly is lazy and sloppy. She goes for the easy answer so she can grab some headlines and promote herself. In essence, he says, I can't respect this Nellie Bly the way I did the other one. Oh, I'm not Jack the Ripper, Nellie. But he's out there. You ought to be more careful. Take care of her, Doc. Yes, the inspector arrested Watson, I mean Jeffrey, too. He has some questions for the Ripper's sidekick. I assume that's what he thinks Jeffrey is. For his next book, Doyle doesn't need to try and make Scotland Yard look like a bunch of ninnies. All he has to do is write about this guy. But right now, he's going to work on Nellie. In one night, you've done what Scotland Yard and the entire London police force couldn't accomplish in a year. You captured Jack the Ripper. Have I? Or was it just a stunt? Well, you seem to have convinced Inspector Lestrade. I get the feeling that isn't difficult. If she had said she saw Doyle's watch instead of a silver omni, the inspector would arrest Sherlock Holmes. He just wants an easy answer so he doesn't have to think too much. Nellie says, I think you and I need to take a trip to the Cock and Crown, the bar where she encountered the Ripper. As they start down the street, we see Drake following them. Another omni. What? The guy I landed on just disappeared in the thin air, right? Yeah. What if he used an omni? But Nelly said she saw a flash of silver. That's right. The only person I know that has a silver omni 
it's Drake. I gave you the important part of that. For over 30 seconds before that clip, we had Jeffrey trying to figure out how Nelly could have seen the Omni, Bog flashing back to his meeting with Drake and seeing the new Silver Omni. As I've said more than once, runtime is a cruel taskmaster, and sometimes it's cruel to us, the viewers, too. The instant Nellie said she saw a flash of silver, we should have gone a whole different direction and started both the inspector and Doyle slash Holmes looking for someone with a silver device like Boggs. I have trouble believing that a reporter of Nellie Bly's caliber would have missed something so obvious as the difference between polished silver and tarnished brass. And considering what Drake tried to do to him, I have trouble believing Boggs' mind wouldn't immediately flash to Drake when Nellie said she saw a silver Omni. This is all taking too long and making intelligent people look as though somebody just dropped an anvil on their head. What's Drake doing here? I don't think he could be the Ripper. No, that's not his style. Foul enough history for revenge is. That's why it's after Nellie. To make sure she wouldn't complete a trip. Yeah. And he wound up with me as a bonus. He failed because she did complete her trip around the world, and she did do it in 72 days. Drake needs to find a new hobby. He sucks at this. And if I got to Nellie like I think I did, she's on her way to the cock and crown. Start screaming. It's time to bust out of this joint. <laughs> Go, Bob! He needs all the speed those long legs can muster, so Jeffrey and his short legs will sit this one out. While Bog races to the cock and crown to stop Drake, Nellie and Doyle have confirmed that someone is following them. In fact, he's abandoned all pretense. There he is. I see him. Here, up here. It's a dead-end alley, and Drake says, Come on out. I just want to return your gun. There you are. Now, where is the good doctor? <laughs> Word of advice, doctor. Don't yell and warn him before you swing your cane. Just hit him. With that minor distraction out of the way, he's back to Nellie. Now, you get your gun. No! no! Grab his Omni. Grab his Omni so he can't get away. Drake's appearance is deceptive because he's as strong as the proverbial ox. Oh no, Bog. It's not that easy. Nobody thinks to grab his Omni. Nellie and Dr. Doyle both saw that, so when the inspector comes and Nellie explains that Bog saved her from the real attacker, the inspector says, well, where is he? I can only report what I saw, Inspector. And what I saw was a man who disappeared. I love Bog and Jeffrey. Huh? Don't look at me. I got nothing. Has he gotten his own Omni back yet? There, I've got it. Sahara sand, South American quartz, sequoia needle. There's only one way you could have picked up all these on this shoe. How? A visit to the Royal Zoological Gardens. Correct, Watson? You amaze me, Sherlock. Seriously, if I was in Jeffrey's place, I'd be more than half inclined to tell Doyle the truth. He's seen an Omni in action. Tell him where it takes you and what you do. He would love to sink his teeth into something like that. Nellie is practically on her knees begging for an exclusive interview with Bog. She says, that man touched his device and disappeared. You have one like it. So he did get it back. So you can disappear too. Bog says, you've never seen me disappear, so you don't know that. Jumping to conclusions only leads to trouble. Begging isn't working. Who are you? What do you do? Now look, Lestrade was able to delay your boat an hour. If you don't leave now, you could blow the whole record. 
You're not going to tell me, are you? No. After all we've been through, you deny me an exclusive? Absolutely. Neither is a lame attempt at seduction. She leans in and gives him a kiss on the cheek, then leaves. That's how it was written by this team. If I'm writing it, she leans in and gives him a kiss on the cheek. While she's doing that, she slips the Omni off his belt the same way everybody else throughout history has done to him a dozen times. He can have it back when he gives her that exclusive interview. Bog and Jeffrey look at each other in consternation and credits. We're set up for next season with a nice cliffhanger. Sadly, the next season didn't happen. The show got good ratings even though it ran opposite 60 Minutes. Some weird things were happening at 60 Minutes at the time, and some exec thought they could take advantage of that and run a similar news magazine type show against it instead of Voyagers. So these geniuses canceled Voyagers and replaced it with a news program called Monitor. Predictably, that show tanked instantly and pretty much nobody watched it. They tried to cover their butts by changing the name and putting it in a different time slot and still nobody cared. For that, they canceled this show. I can't help but flash back to the time tunnel because the same thing happened to it. Some executive got a bug up his butt about a show he wanted to air and canceled the time tunnel to air it. As I recall, it lasted 17 episodes, or the same as Mr. Terrific, one of the shows I reviewed in my series, The Dumbbell Derby. I would have cast someone other than Julia Duffy as Nellie Bly, but that's because I've never cared for Julia Duffy's acting. Your mileage may vary, and that's okay. Other than that, this was a great episode to go out on. It had everything. For sure, it left us wanting more. This series was John Eric Hexham's first major acting role, and he nailed it down tight. The chemistry between Jeffrey and Bog is truly wondrous, something you don't see that often. You really believe that from the first day, they're developing a father-son relationship and depending on each other. You know that someday Bog is going to have to explain to Jeffrey why he likes women so much. Speaking of which, some of that seemed a little excessive at times, but, I mean, look at this. Straight women are going to find that attractive and want some of it. Gay men are going to find that attractive and want some of it. I find that attractive and want some of it. So his romantic escapades are believable. This is an excellent series that got shortchanged. You can get the DVD set on Amazon and several other places. I recommend you do so. Sit down and enjoy it again and again. That's what I'm going to do.